knowing is just having stuff in your head, but you've got, you've got to apply it and refine it. You've got to refine it. You've got to get feedback. It's the only way to develop expertise. And it's only when you've got expertise that you can rely on instinct, which is something that expert coaches have, this intuition. Mm-hmm. But you can't develop that without just repeated efforts, repeated practice. Mm-hmm. It's the way that it's the way that firefighters know if just intuitively if a, if a house is going to burn down from the inside is because they've just been there. They can smell it. They can, you know, they, they've got the feeling on their ears. That's that's gut instinct. Mm. That's what coaching instinct is. Knowledge is part of that, but experience is the biggest part of it. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by David Joyce. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, normally we would do the whole week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods, but I am batching all of these up so all of us, myself, my podcast producers, everybody can enjoy a little bit of downtime around the holidays. So with that being said, what I want to do today is highlight one of my favorite moments from this week's episode. And I want to give you something to think about. So one of the primary topics that David and I talked about was this idea of developing coaches. And this is something that I think is so critical in our industry today, because right now there is just a wealth of information. Like I don't even know how much more information, but a heck of a lot more than when I got started. So again, I go back to when I started as a coach, I could buy books I could buy VHS tapes, I could go to the library and find research articles and literally photocopy them and take them home. Like that's how I had to learn things. Or I could go in the gym and I could shadow other coaches. But the availability of information was incredibly small versus where we're at now, where I could literally go on the internet and connect with virtually any high level coach at any point in time. I could go to Google Scholar and literally download PDFs of probably about half to two thirds of the articles that I'm interested in learning about. So my point here is simple. The information is not the issue anymore. The bigger issue that we're having now is being able to filter that information and then figure out how to use it judiciously with the clients, athletes, PT patients, whatever the case may be that we're working with, okay? So one of the keys, at least for me, when we are developing young coaches is finding ways to sharpen their critical thinking skills and to give them real world experience working with other people. That's a big, big point because right now, it's, I hate bashing on the internet or social media, but it, you can very quickly tell if you've done this for any extended period of time, who is actually working with real people and who is just regurgitating or talking about stuff on the internet. And Joe Ken and I have had this discussion numerous times. I know I've talked about it on this show numerous times, but Joe was telling me, and I've had this happen to me too, where some young coach starts monologuing about a given topic. Let's just say it's jump training. And at the end, Joe will stop him and say, okay, that's great. I know that's what Verkashansky said about jump training. What do you think or what do you believe about jump training? And it doesn't have to be jump training. It could be jump training or sprint training. You know, you hear the people that like just recite Charlie Francis or you hear about strength training and people are just regurgitating Louis Simmons work, right? Like that's fine. You need to take that information. You need to learn it. But then you need to absorb it and you need to apply it and figure out ways to make it your own. And I think the more we can teach our young coaches to have a strong filter and to understand situations where things would work or wouldn't work or when it may be appropriate to try something with a given client or athlete, now we're really going to develop and groom some high level young coaches. So that's my thought for today. Hope you enjoyed it. We're going to take a quick break. And then we're going to jump into this awesome episode with my guy, David Joyce. Believe it or not, 2022 is right around the corner. And I want to help you make it your best year ever. As 2021 wraps up, I've made it a goal to totally revamp my online coaching platforms. 
The fact of the matter is I wanna help more people than ever before, and that starts with people like you. So if you're interested in getting in the best shape of your life this year, I've got two options that might interest you. Option number one is my private online coaching. Here, we'll essentially take offline training and move it online. We'll start with an initial startup call to learn all about you, your needs and goals. I'll create a custom, personalized program that's gonna help you achieve said goals, and we'll communicate regularly to make sure that you're on the right track and getting great results. I'm only taking a maximum of five new clients in 2022. So if you're interested in my one-on-one -on -one online coaching, send me an email at mike at robertsontrainingsystems.com. Now, private coaching may not be for everyone. So if that's the case, I'm also totally revamping my RTS annual program for 2022, and that could potentially be a great fit for you as well. In this program, we go through four three-month phases of training building the engine, leaning season, athletic domination, and stronger. But the cool part of this program is that it's more than just a training program. Every month, you'll not only get a new workout to follow, but we'll also set monthly challenges where we develop habits in regards to nutrition, recovery, and mindset to help ensure that next year is your best year ever. And trust me, I know the last two years haven't always been kind to our habits and routines, so that portion of the program alone is worth the price of admission. If you're interested in the annual training group, you can learn more at robertsontrainingsystems.com forward slash annual. And if you've got any questions whatsoever, feel free to email me directly at mike at robertsontrainingsystems.com and I'll do my best to point you in the right direction. Okay, that's enough from me. Thank you so much for listening and I'd love the chance to work with you and help you make 2022 your best year ever. David Joyce has trained, rehabilitated, and maintained multiple world champions, including Olympians and more than 100 national champions. The first athletic performing coach in history to work with Team China after having worked with another national Olympic team, Joyce is a high performance and leadership specialist with the Performance Union, where he provides high performance and leadership consultancy services to elite organizations worldwide. In this show, David and I talk about some really interesting topics including coaching development and how to build better coaches for the long haul, what he means when he talks about executive coaching, and how to improve your decision-making hygiene. Now, the audio gets spotty on us a little bit here and there. Unfortunately, the internet gremlins between here and Sydney are not always friendly, but there is so much great information and so many great thoughts in this episode. I really, really think you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Dave, man, thank you so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to have you back on. Start by just telling us a little bit about yourself. Hey, Mike. Yeah, my name is David Joyce. I am a, a high performance practitioner based in Sydney, Australia, and I am the co-editor of High Performance Training for Sports, and I run a company called Synapsing, which is a sports strategy and decision-making uh, consultancy. What we do is we go into businesses and bring the best of high performance optimization principles into executive leadership teams, but then we also go into sports and bring the, the best of business as well. And so I've, I've got, got those things, do quite a bit of exec coaching. And on the side, I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work with, with athletes and I'm a full-time dad and husband. <laughs> so you got a few things going on is what you're saying. Yeah, there's a, there's a few plates being spun, but uh, no, no, it's all it's all really good. It's all uh, really good and great, great to be back with you. Yeah, I love it, man. So talk to me, like what's new since the last time you were on the show? I feel like it's been a couple of years. I mean, it, it all meshes together after a while. Yeah. But like what's new, yeah. what's changed for you in the last couple of years? Oh, well, we've had a pandemic. That's, yeah. um, that's, been, that's been in the interim since we last spoke, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so obviously the the new books come out. I've finished off my MBA, which I was doing for a, quite a while. So that's that's all in the rearview mirror. And I guess the the other things is that I've got a, got a couple of kids now, and I think I've evolved in my my thinking about performance quite a bit. And you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have since since we last spoke, which I reckon was four years ago on the pod. Oh my I reckon, gosh. It might be, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, really fortunate to have read a load of books and met a load of people that have helped 
clarify my thinking about certain things and raised up new issues that I hadn't thought about. So, yeah, I, I think hopefully, hopefully our conversation today will be different to the one we had four years ago. For sure. For sure. So one thing that I want to start with, and I love this topic, is this idea of coach development. I know you're passionate about it as well. So like, why is this something you're so into? Why are you excited about grooming and developing new coaches? So that is probably the one of the biggest shifts in, in my career over the last five years or so, something like, like I've always had a passion for developing people because mm-hmm. ultimately that's, I think, what we do. And if we think about what we do as parents, as strength coaches, but also if you're working in business, what you're trying to do is you, you're coaching people. That's the red thread that goes through things. And we can achieve scale in what we do by helping other coaches that go and help athletes or help other people, whatever, whatever industry they're in. So I recognise that the best way for me to amplify what I do and what I say is to is to help other coaches, you know. I, what I see in sport a lot is that, particularly in strength coaching, people are really motivated to improve. That's why there's just, there's so many books and resources available. Yep. But what that does do is looks at development just through the lens of knowledge. And I actually think there's probably four lenses that we need to look at development. So there's knowledge, then there's capabilities, then there's experience, and then there's personal attributes. So there's four mm-hmm. things there. Certainly with, with the books that I've done and, and you know the podcasts that you do, what we're trying to do is knowledge. But I guess what we're also trying to do is, is tap the wisdom of the crowd to increase the, the ability for people to have those competencies and the experience that we've got to fast track that for other people. And I, it's just something I'm, I'm really passionate about. And, and what I've seen is that when you do help people in this way, it gives just this flood of oxytocin and serotonin in my own brain. Yeah. So it's just, just a really nice feeling to help people along on their own journey as well. So I guess that's what I, that's why I do it. Yeah, no, I love it. And, you know, when we put this on like the questions, one of the things that immediately made me think about was like the internship program that we've had at our gym, why yeah, right. I, I've evolved that to some degree into mentorship. I don't do a ton of it because, you know, there's only so many hours in the day, but it's one of those yep. things where you could have two, three, four hours of those things in a row. And mentally, you may be a little bit tired because, you know, you're using a lot of brain power. But at the same time, like you're very excited when you're done because you can feel this change. And you can yeah, that's see right. you can see these coaches evolving in front of your eyes. So when you brought that up as a topic, I was like, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that. Yeah, no, this is exactly right. And I, I think it all gets down to neurochemistry. So it's what we're all trying to do is optimize the uh, the chemicals that flood our brain. We're all yeah. trying to do that. Whether you're you're going for a drink with your buddies on a Friday night or, you know, you're playing with your kids or whatever it is, you're doing that because you're trying to make your brain feel better. Yeah. People like yourself, the reason you run internships is is absolutely not for any financial reward. It is because you're committed to making other people better, which in turn makes you feel good. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, I, I see a lot of it done. I see a lot of it done pretty poorly. You know, we see coach education masquerading as coach development, and that's not really what education, that's not really what development is. Coach education is going to an airport hotel and, you know, standing in front delivering a curriculum. But we know that that doesn't really shift the needle on practice. Yeah, Coach development really is is meeting the coach where they're at and that is, you know, on the field of play, in the gym, whatever it is, you know, on the pool deck and helping them get the information that's in their brain and delivering that, which mm-hmm. is why internships and what you do is just so powerful and more powerful than just delivering a seminar. It's not to say that seminars are not helpful. Right. It's just that I would say that they're, they're necessary but not sufficient. I like that. Yeah, I did a, a call. It's going to be spread out, obviously, because the way podcasts are released. But I actually did a a call earlier with Luca Hasavar. And one of the things we talked about is like learning is really only the first step, right? Like there's learning and then there's actually doing. 
and talking about how important the doing side of it is so that you understand like, hey, it's one thing to learn it, but then you have to actualize it and to put it into practice or play is a totally different step in the equation. Yeah, I agree with that. But the, the, the slight nuance is that putting it into action is part of learning. Mm. So yeah, I guess the 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 there would be the difference between knowing and learning. Mm. Knowing is just having stuff in your head, but you've got you've got to apply it and yeah. refine it. You've got to refine it. You've got to get feedback. It's the only way to develop expertise, and it's only when you've got expertise that you can rely on instinct, which is something that expert coaches have this intuition. Mm-hmm. But you can't develop that without just repeated efforts, repeated practice. Mm-hmm. It's the way that it's the way that firefighters know if just intuitively if a, if a house is going to burn down from the inside is because they've just been there. They can smell it. They can you know they, they've got the feeling on their ears. That's that's gut instinct. Mm-hmm. That's what coaching instinct is. Knowledge is part of that, but experience is the biggest part of it. So that's I think that's. You know, just to take your analogy a little bit further yeah. is not just knowing it, it's doing it. And you're 100% right. I love that. I love that. Okay. So I realize this is a big question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. How can we, as an industry, start developing better coaches from the get-go? So we, we, we've got to think about knowledge. We've got to think about experiences, capabilities. And when I'm talking about capabilities, I'm talking, some people call them soft skills. I don't like that term. I think they're human skills. And the reason yeah. I don't like soft skills is because they're hard to do. Yeah. So that's that's influence. That's negotiation. That is communication, those sorts of things. The stuff that, you know, Brett Bartholomew and Nick Winkleman talk a lot about, and they're really important for very good reason, is because ultimately what we're trying to do is get someone to move in a direction you want them to move. Sure. They're really important. And also the personal characteristics, the personal characteristics of things like growth mindset, ability to to focus, ability to shut off, ability to regulate your own and other people's emotions. Those sorts of things are so important. So to reconceptualize it, I think what will be really helpful is to have some concept of where you're at at the moment along those four domains and you can go, well, you know what? I've got a really deep well of knowledge about strength, power, rate of force development, you know, force velocity, all those sorts of things. Yep. And yet I'm not quite where I need to be. Is it because I'm not transferring that? Is it because I'm not communicating it? And, you know, if oftentimes you can have something which is in your grey matter but unless you can communicate it with kindness, if you unless you can meet the coach or the athlete where they're at and be able to talk in their terms and share the mental models, yep. you know, you're not going to be Mike Robertson. You know, you're not going to be one of the master coaches. You just, you're not. But it takes that sort of inventory of going, well, where where are my growth edges? Where can I improve? Is it knowledge? Do I need to do I need to go and do a master's? Right. Or do I actually need to do an internship or do I need to understand a little bit more about negotiation and perspective taking and all these sorts of things? And I, once we can once we conceptualise that coaching is both art and science and once we can get a little bit granular about where we stand and our opportunities to improve in those areas, that's that's where we'll, we'll get biggest gains is my thoughts. Um, what, what do you think about that, Mike? You know, one of the things that you said, and I think people gloss over it, I, I don't love the term soft skills either. I think just in general, there's like a negative connotation to that for whatever reason. But one of the things that you hit on that I think a lot of people tend to gloss over is just the power and the impact of communication, mm. you know, because knowledge and knowing things is so valuable and it's so readily accessible these days, right? So you and I are of a certain age where if you wanted to learn something, either you had to go to a library and photocopy, you know, like journals and that sort of thing, or you had to go and read Flex magazine or whatever. Knowledge is so accessible now. But in that same sense, it's easy to say, oh, I know this, or I know this, I know this. But it's a totally different ballgame when you have to relay those thoughts to somebody else or to make it 
to give it meaning to somebody else. So we had a huge, actually, kind of side tangent to our, our internship meeting the other day about the role and the power of communication. Yeah. So I, we may be a little bit tangential here, but, you know, a squat could be a fantastic exercise. But to a rugby player and a bodybuilder and a power lifter and a fat loss client, there's a different rationale behind each of those. So yeah, part of the yeah. art art of what we do is being able to communicate effectively the benefits of that activity and how it's going to help somebody achieve their goal. Yeah, I agree with that. And and basically what you're saying there, the way I conceptualize it is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Yeah. And and going, well, the, the client, the athlete, they're viewing this problem from this lens. We're viewing it from this lens. The, the technician is viewing it from another lens. There's only so many hours in the day. Like we think squatting is really important, but, you know, our opinions are not necessarily shared by absolutely everyone. Right. It's up to us to determine, is that a hill we need to die on? And yep. if so, we we actually, we can't influence with facts and figures. Like we've seen, absolutely. We've, seen we've, we've seen this fail time and time again over the past two years with the, with the pandemic. Like facts and figures don't move people the way we think they will. Right. It's emotions that move people. And the greatest yeah. coaches are the ones that can understand where where the clients, where there's what their goals are and how what you know moves them towards their goal. That's the rub. Yeah. And that's that's what master coaches do. Is it's not just they don't just know about rate of force development. They're actually in human psychology, sociology, anthropology, all these sorts of things wrapped up in that one package. Yep. That's what that's what elite coaching is. Yeah, yeah. And just to, to riff off of that, I feel like too often people associate motivation with like the rah-rah high energy guy. Mm. And I don't think that's always the case. Like you alluded to, I think some of the best motivators, communicators are the ones that just know the right buttons to push. Yeah. So they don't have to be the rah-rah in your face kind of guy. They just know what button to push with you to get the desired response. Sometimes you need the rah-rah in your back pocket because there will be times where that is a really effective tool. By and large, I think coaches that rely on motivating have a fairly short shelf life because yes. motivation waxes and wanes. It's the coaches that can shift identity of people. They're the ones that are really successful over a long period of time. But I guess there are times where a bit of rah-rah is just so helpful. And it's, it's, yeah. all, neuro, it's, all, it's all neuro-linguistic programming, but that can't be the sole tool in your toolkit. And there are, there are times where, you know, you've just come off a bad loss or something. And, you know, Rhett Larson talks about this really beautifully where he says that if you come in and no one in your group leaves with a good feeling, you know, they don't feel like they've had at least a win. Yep. If you've not positively changed their neurochemistry in some way, then you're failed as a strength coach. Mm. So your your job is to change not just the actin and myosin and the sliding filaments theory, all that sort of yeah. stuff, which, you know, the we're not just physiologists. Right. Our job is to change neurochemistry and to get people feeling really good about themselves, feeling really good about their, their place in the team and all these sorts of things. If you've not done something to give at least a little win, then you've not done your job as a strength coach. Yep. I love that. I love that. And again, we're kind of, kind of going get with this thought process here, but I love it because I feel like that's something that I've always tried to do with my teams, with my athletes is, you know, you, you can't always impact how they walk in, but I feel like you can always impact for the better how they walk out. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great phrase. Yeah, I love that. I love so that. anyway, good stuff. Okay. So another topic that I want to make sure we, we dive into is something I've not heard this term before, but you put me onto it is career curation or executive coaching. So just for starters, give me some insight. Like, what does that mean? How do you play into that? Like, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So I reckon probably about 20% of my time is coaching individual people, right? Okay. So yeah. some of them are in sport, you know, in the NFL, in the MLS, um, you know, sports around the world. And probably half of the 
the, the rest of the people are executives in business, in, in gaming, in finance, in marketing, in all sorts of different work, walks of life. The red thread that unites them all is they're all trying to uh, improve their careers. They're all trying to navigate the complexity of, of life and, you know, dealing with directs and dealing with bosses and dealing with conflict and dealing with all these sorts of things. But I guess one of the big things that I talk a lot to these guys about is career curation. And that's that's where you're taking responsibility for your own development mm -hmm. and you're, uh, you're, you're viewing it through the lens of being a gardener rather than a carpenter. It's not just going, okay, well, I'm going to add this qualification and that, then that qualification, which is more of a, a carpentry approach. A gardening approach is going, well, what are the things that I need to do to be able to flourish? And gardeners don't just plant um, seeds. What they do is they make sure the soil is is good. They're watering. They're doing all these sorts of things. Yeah. They're weeding. They're, they're, it's a constant iterative process. And I, I think of career curation in exactly the same way. It is understanding who you are. I'll, I'll take a step back, Mark, if that's okay. I'm I guess one of the, the fundamental principle that I do a lot of work with, with my guys and girls on this is thinking about fit. Now, fit for me is composed of three parts. So the first part is knowing yourself, and that is what, what your values are. We do a lot of work understanding values, doing a lot of work about purpose and mission, but also strengths and weaknesses as well. So you really do need to know yourself very well. Yeah. What's, what's, your, what's your trajectory? You know, what's your mission in life? If you're going to die at the age of 130, what do you what do you want read out about you at your funeral? Those sorts of things. Yep. So that's that's you knowing that you are a square pig, <laughs> right? The next part of the fit equation is knowing what you're looking for. So if you're a, if you're a round peg, you need to know that you're looking for a round hole. So that might be when you're looking at a job, it might be, I need to, I need this amount of salary. I need this amount of, of health care. I need these sorts of hours. I need this location. I need to work with this sort of person who is going to look after my career and give me opportunities. I need exposure to this type of experience, whatever it is. It's really knowing what it is that you're looking for. Right. So if we recap, we've, we now know that you're a round peg a round peg knows that they're looking for a round hole. Yep. And then the third part, which is the bit that's often missed, is doing your work to understand if this opportunity, whether it's an employer, whether it is a, you know, a business opportunity, whatever, is, is that the round hole that I'm looking for? Mm. Or can it be fashioned into that? Okay. Because oftentimes you'll... I see people that have got a pretty good understanding of what they, of who they are, what they're looking for. And then they just fail in the job because it's not them and it's not the employer. It's just a square. So it's really having the vision and curating that intentionally. That's, that's the big part. And, you know, the Japanese have got a term called Ikigai, which is this confluence of four circles of knowing what you're good at, knowing what, sparks joy or what really energizes you knowing what the world needs and knowing what you can get paid for mm. and if you can the intersection of that venn diagram there that's where you want to be playing okay that's where you have maximum impact that's where you are at your best self that's where you flourish that's the curation part of your career that i think is so important that's interesting would you say, is it similar to like you would you would mentor a coach and help them understand themselves and become better at what they do? Is it similar to that just in the sense of you're not building a better coach, you're trying to g legitimately build like the career that you're best suited for where you can thrive or maximize yourself? Yeah, so that's a huge part of what I do. And then the other part is 
you know, someone will come to me and say, oh, I'm, re- I'm really struggling getting buy-in with the, with the coach or, you know, my executive leadership team, there's, there's a lot of conflict or I've got to appoint a new board member. And so we do a lot of problem solving around that. Mm. And that's kind of when I'm coaching them yes. and giving them resources and the like. But you're absolutely right is the career curation bit ultimately I can't impose anything on anyone because that's that would be the wrong type of coaching it is is shining the light onto a dimly lit corner so that they can help discover things themselves Hmm. I like that a lot okay so I'm really interested in this next topic because again there's always back and forth before the show and and sometimes you guys give me thoughts and things you want to talk about so I've heard of body hygiene I've heard of sleep hygiene but I've never heard the term Decision hygiene. So what is that? Decision-making hygiene, I guess the the, the important word that we missed out there was making. It's not just the decision. It's the process upon which you make decisions. So oftentimes, and you'll, you'll know this yourself, Mike, working in sport for so long, that we often will evaluate a decision by its outcome. Sure. And... Sometimes that's appropriate, but oftentimes it's not because we can make a good decision and have a poor outcome because of factors outside of our control or we can make a really poor decision and just by luck have a good outcome. Yeah. And luck by and large works 50-50. If you had the same decision-making process again, there's every chance that it would be a poor outcome. Sure. Right. So decision making hygiene is making sure that the process that you use to make a decision it reduces the influence of luck. Okay. And there are there are several ways that you, you do this and it's all contextual, but a lot of it is is understanding the need to have diversity of narratives. So, you know, we talk about the, the need for diverse diversity in boards. So we can have a look at a number of different, we can, we, can, we can engage a number of different ways of looking at a problem. We can really widen our options. So the, the Dan and Chip Heath have got a really nice model called the RAP model, which I like, is widening your assumptions. So widening your options. So let's just say, you know, I've got a, I've got a client who is having an issue with his, with his daughter and the daughter says, you know, I want to go to this party or I stay home what we tend to do in life is to think of things as being binary. Yeah. It's going, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Yep. But actually we may be able to put some more options in the decision-making basket. So okay. widening our options, right? So, yeah. so that's, that's really important. What we tend to do as humans and go, I'm going to buy this squat rack or I'm going to buy a hip thrust machine or I'm going to buy this squat rack or I'm not going to buy this squat rack. Right, but there, there may in fact be lots of different options there. Mm, okay. So the next bit is reality testing your assumptions. So we go into a decision assuming a lot of knowledge, a lot of things, but it's worthwhile actually if you've got the time to look at how you can test whether those assumptions actually hold water. Okay. The next one is attaining distance. So if you've got a big, if you've got a big decision to make, we can often get too close to it. So it's helpful to have some physical distance from it, some temporal distance. Even going from a, for a run means that we don't just get on the treadmill of doing this, doing this, doing this because it's the next step. Right. So making sure we do that, and I and I think that the last bit involves the process of getting the wisdom of the crowds is really trying to get other people to weigh in on the decision to be made as well. Yeah. Now, I, I think the important nuance here is that oftentimes you won't have the ability to take the time to do this. Like if you've got to make a decision really quickly now, yeah. and that gets down to because the landscape's going to shift dramatically if I don't make this decision. Right. Right. That makes sense. But if you've got a big decision, like, am I going to buy this house? Am I going to employ this person? Am I going to 
completely change my strength program for my team. Right. This is not a decision you need to make today. Absolutely. These are things that we actually do need to take some time to develop and to, to go through a process. And this is the, the hygiene part of it is really understanding what are the critical components to making a decision rather than just resting on gut instinct. Yeah. Or rather than just think, oh, I've, I'm going to do this just so I get it off the plate and then I can move to the next decision. That's how things get rushed. That's, that's how the, the space shuttle fell out of the sky, those sorts of things. Yeah. We can do better than that. Hmm. That's really interesting. So I, I'd kind of written down as you started on that, if there was like this formula or this series of questions, but I think you kind of alluded to that, or maybe not a series of questions, but like a series of steps that you want to yeah. go through right before making like a big decision. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then there are lots of things It all, it is somewhat contextual, but, but I think that that sort of the wrap framework is actually a really nice way to start it. And it's a, it's a really good book. It's a very approachable book by Dan and Chip Heath okay. th- that your listeners can look at as well. And, and the good thing about that is that framework actually holds water. When I go into big, Fortune 500 companies and the like, that that model holds um, holds true. So I'm I'm really confident that it can be applied in in most situations in life. In fact, yeah, I love that. And I think one of the things that I've experienced that idea, and again, we tend to gravitate towards the things that have worked for us, right? But like that idea of creating space or giving yeah. getting distance between things, because I think it's only human nature, right? When things get get big or there's pressure for whatever reason, right? It could be in sport. It could be in life. It's easy to get very emotional and then make a a rush or a snap decision. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we see with social media that it's, it's basically frictionless to, to make a, uh, a retort on something, you know, which is all based by, by human, like the, the, the chimp aspect of our brain Yeah, and being able to sleep on it is almost never a bad idea. Yeah, absolutely. I love it, man. Okay, so one last thing I would love to talk about is the book. Obviously, second round at this. So you've gone through this whole process two times. Just talk to me a little bit about that. What is that process like? How does it get started? Like, how many times do you want to quit (laughs) as you're going through (laughs) it? Like, just talk to me about the process of that, because it seems as though it would be quite the undertaking. Yeah. How many times do I want to quit? I think it is, the answer is one fewer time than the one, the times I want to go on. Yeah. And that's, so that's a lot, you know, probably where it was certainly triple figures, <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully the, the will to go on exceeds that by one. So, but how do we, how do we do it? Well, so the first one was, was really successful. Yep. People really liked high performance training for sports. And I think for a number of reasons. One was it was written in a language that was approachable. Two, it was written in a way that was applicable now. Like it was never intended to be a series of systematic reviews or anything. It is, it really was trying to gather the best in the world to write about their area of expertise, their yeah. one word. Yeah. And then the third, the third thing was, you know, just the quality of people that we had contribute. I think was was second to none, and, and, a, and a different approach to sports textbooks. Uh, and it was published in two fourteen, two fifteen, I think. And um, what we'd seen was that we'd, we'd had a huge gain in popularity, but there was a new wave of strength coaches and and performance experts coming through yep. that hadn't seen it and had different thoughts and 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 what we wanted to do was reconnect with the industry with with the community and say well there are things that have changed there are people that have got new uh, levels of expertise and also what we wanted to do was we could see that with the benefit of hindsight the the first one was incomplete okay so what we wanted to do was to address that so when the when the publishers uh, human kinetics said, "Oh, would you do it another copy for us?" The initial instinct was no because I didn't want to put my family through that. But actually, <laughs> the 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 bigger the bigger issue was 
there, there was a real need and we could serve the, the, the industry here. So most second editions, Mike, as you know, would be about 30% different. They slap on a new cover, a few different graphics, the one or two different chapters. But what my co-editor, Dan, and I felt was we wanted to do something really quite different. We wanted to, we wanted to make it so that if you bought the first one and then bought the second one, you saw there was a real value proposition there. Like mm-hmm. there, you didn't, you wouldn't be disappointed and feel like you'd been cheated because it was basically the same, right. same book with a different cover. So this, this one's about eighty percent different. It's effectively a new book. There's thirty five new contributors. There's sixteen new chapters. It is fundamentally a different book. And what we actually really wanted to do, so we've still got the the pillars of aerobic capacity development flexibility, strength, you know, all the things that the the foundations of high performance. But what we've really tried to do is what put in what we call suspension chapters is Mm. these are the chapters that if we go back to right at the beginning of our our conversation, Mike, we talked about knowledge and then we talked about um, capabilities. What we wanted to do was to put some chapters in here, which helped with capabilities. So Nick Winkleman's chapter on on language of coaching is a capability. Yeah. Brett Bartholomew's chapter on influence is a capability. Sam Robertson and Jackie Tran wrote a brilliant chapter about learning and curating the learning environment. Mm. So all of these things, what we're trying to do is how do we look at performance and how do we communicate performance as being an output of a complex system of which there are separate but inseparable parts. Mm. And that's how we try to put this together is to coalesce things. So when I read it, I wouldn't start at Chapter 1 and and then go through to Chapter 27. I would go on the bit that was most pressing for me and then go on a bit of an adventure and go, right, well, if I'm going to read about uh, speed training, Training with Stu McMillan and JB Marin, which is an unbelievably good chapter. I can't do that unless I've got really good movement competencies and movement efficiency. So I'm going to now read Matt Jordan's chapter, which is another unbelievably good chapter. And so you kind of pick your way through yeah. the book rather than go from, from front cover to back. You, you kind of choose the journey that is most applicable for you and the environment that you're in at the moment. Yeah. I'm really I'm really happy that we've we've been able to achieve that, but when we're sitting together again talking about the third edition whenever that may be, I'm sure we'll we'll have found ways to improve this one, but currently I I'm I'm really proud of it and and think it's a it's it's a it's a good book. Yeah, you should be, man. It's it's a beautiful book. I mean, amazing authors like it's like a who's who when you look through that. So, you did quite well well for yourself, man. You should be proud. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, we really did want it to be the the lens that we had was to go, right, well, imagine having the world's best conference on high performance. Who are some of the people that we would want to get in there? Yeah. And that's what we've we've attempted to do. And and luckily a lot of them are our friends. And, you know, because the first one was was successful, we even people that we didn't know, we could we could onboard quite quickly because they, they could see that, you know, it was a good thing to be a part of. Absolutely. All right, my friend. I know it is getting close to morning there for you, and you've got things to do on your day. So we got our lightning round, four fairly short questions, and uh, let's do we'll it. get you out of here, okay? All let's right. do it. Let's do it. So the first one, and I'm sure this is like asking who your favorite child is, uh, but do you have a favorite chapter in the new book or like <laughs> one chapter that really stood out to you? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but what I can, what I can say is that the chapter I'm going to hedge this by saying there there's two chapters that are really quite different and surprising. Nick Winkleman's chapter on on coaching and queuing is unlike any other sports textbook chapter ever written because mm-hmm. what he does is it's a it's a narrative. He tells a story, and it's a bit of a page turner. You you really start reading it and you want to know what happens in the story, and only only by stealth at the end, do you realise that you've learnt quite a bit? He just weaves in things so beautifully. And the other one is is a concept which is overlooked and undervalued, and that's the warm-up side. I talked about Rhett Larson. He, he's written a masterful chapter about mm. how warm-up is a real 
performance advantage. And if you're a coach, that might be one of the, the, the most important touch points that you have with your athletes. It's a beautifully written chapter. One that when I was reading it, and I've been in this game for a, a long time, as, um, as have you, Mike, and you go, well, geez, I've learned stuff out of this. And I would have, prior to this, I would have gone, what could I learn about warm-up? It turns out right. quite a lot. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so Rhett's just done a, a brilliant job there. He's he's the master in in all of these in all of these aspects. And so, I'm going to hedge my bets by saying these are two surprising chapters. I won't say they're my like my favourite, but they're my most they're the most surprising. I like it. Very very PC of you as well. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, what's the best part about Australia in the summer? Ah, uh, what a question. Uh, so what I love won't necessarily resonate with all your listeners, but I love the smell of freshly cut grass, the sun baking down, cricket in the background and the sport of cricket in the background. Yes. And just having having done a training session, had a dip in the water, the sun coming down and and it, the a cold beer going, going down my throat. I, it's the thing I love the most. Yeah. That won't be unique to Australia, but it is absolutely identifiably Australian. Ah, that sounds like a pretty epic day. I think I could yeah, support that. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I try and curate the best day, that's what it looks like. I love it. Okay, number three. We all know books age fast these days. How long until the third edition of High Performance Training comes out? If you ask a woman who's just given birth when they're likely to have another <laughs> yeah. one. yeah. Mostly they will say never <laughs> yep. or the same can be said by, about someone who's just run a marathon. Yep. I suspect the, the stuff we've got in here will be current for another four to five years. Okay. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? Like it, it depends on the pace of technology and, and data and things like that. But we've, we've tried to make this timeless, but I suspect we'll be having this conversation again in, what are we now, 2021, probably 2025. Yeah. 2020, 26, something like that. And, and how much involvement do you have to have in that process? Like, obviously there's like, like you said, you're finding the best authors and the best practitioners. Like how much back and forth is there with you throughout that process? Is it like, hey, this is what I want you to write about? Or is it like, hey, here's a speed chapter, write about speed? It's an excellent question. And it, it really does depend on on the author and the topic as well. Mm. So we, we've got a really good handle. We, we think we've got a really good handle on what we want to hear. So, so this book, whilst all the chapters are written by other people, it is Dan and my DNA in it as well. Yes. So we've, we've sort of, we've sort of curated that. Um, some authors are just, they're all, they're all amazing coaches, but some have greater abilities to to communicate that in the written form yes. than yes. others yes and so th those people that don't have that skill in their toolkit we've got to do quite a bit of work to help them find their voice in the yes. written word yes they've all got their voice yes. but it's just finding that and getting that out yes so there are there are some chapters where we've had to do a bit more work than others and then you know it wouldn't be wouldn't be smart for us to engage someone to speak to Soph Nymphius or Stu McMillan and, and JB and say, right, well, we want you to write about speed or agility and these are the things we want you to cover and, no, you can't talk about that. Like that doesn't fit well with me. There's no creative control on behalf of the expert there. Yeah. So what we've done is gone, well, this is the broad skeleton of the things that we want to cover in the book. Does that jive with what you're want to talk about as well because everyone's got their own agenda what they want to talk about what's what's of interest to them and we we want them to write about things that motivates them what gives them energy and basically the the main cue that we gave to the authors was what are the questions when you speak at a conference what are the questions you get asked the most mm. it's never about acton and myosin it's never about that right it's about you know, when you go into a facility and you're doing a masterclass, what is it that people want to hear about? Because if if you go into a an organisation and they want to hear about that, I will bet my life savings 
that there are a thousand other organizations or a thousand other people, 10,000 other yes. people that want to hear the same thing. Yep. So let's, let's scale that. That's what we've tried to do. We've tried to scale wisdom in this book. I love it. I love it. Great stuff. Okay. Last but not least, number four, what's next for David Joyce? You at least have a four year window where you're not crafting a book. So what's yeah. next for you, man? So the next thing for me is we've just emerged from lockdown. So the next thing for me is being able to go to a restaurant and heading overseas in March, or m- maybe February. There's a possibility I'll go to North America in February and then, but certainly Europe in, in March. And I guess that professionally the next thing is is really taking the consultancy to the next level and, and sort of spreading the message about what we do as human performance uh, coaches and taking that into business, but also bringing the business world into, into, into sport and strategy and decision-making into sport and, and whether that's with individual coaches or, you know, with GMs and helping hiring and, and these sorts of things, that's, that's what we do. So the next four years will be the, the constant iteration of that and, and honing the value proposition and making sure that what we're doing is, you know, contributes to, the overall society. That's what that's what we want to do is do social good. So hopefully the next time we chat on air about this sort of stuff, we'll be able to put a bit more details on the on the plan for you. I love it. Well, David, again, thank you so much for your time today, man. Always great catching up. Where can my listeners find out more about you? I guess the the main thing is hopefully they've engaged with the podcast and can speak to speak to you more about these sorts of concepts as well, Mike. And then to reach out to me directly Twitter's pretty good. Um, I'm not prolific on it, but I, I do read every message and that's at David G. Joyce or LinkedIn as well is, is a good way. So I'm um, really happy to to engage with the group that I'm lucky to call myself a part of. So, yeah. and thank, thank you, Mike. Like I, I know, I know people often say this, but I, I want to add my voice to the chorus. You, what you do here is an unbelievable service. Like, thank you. People don't pay for your podcast. You do this out of the, the goodness of your, your heart and you, your value proposition is so strong. Like I listen to your podcast all the time and I hope – sometimes I'll listen to a podcast and go, that – and not, not your podcast, by the way, but a <laughs> podcast and go, and, and geez, I, I didn't like that. And then I remind myself, it's free. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> That's the day and age um, we live in, man. Yeah, and so I, I would like, I would encourage the the listeners to to really take a moment to understand the amount of work that you put in um, to to get the guests and to so thoughtfully curate the questions and the like. Um, and and I don't take it for granted for one moment. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, man. And again, it's just always great catching up with you. You're you're one of those guys. I feel like we can always sit down and chat and have a great discussion. You never know where it's going to go, but I enjoy that aspect of it too. Cause you're always thinking you're always curious. So I just love what you're doing, man. Keep it up. Yeah, no, I, I think the same about you, Mike. So that's why we, we connect so well. So thank you. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with David Joyce. Really hope you enjoyed it. He's one of those guys where we've never met in real life, but we always have such great conversations whenever he's been on the show. It's not just me peppering him with questions. It always feel like there's more of a dialogue or more of a back and forth. So huge, huge fan of David, all the great work he's doing. And I'll be honest, I have a copy of his book. If you have not picked this up, even if you don't read it right now today, if you don't read it cover to cover, pick up a copy. It is just a wealth of knowledge from some of the world's foremost experts in their given field. So Definitely a book you want to check out. Now, if you enjoyed this week's episode, got a small favor to ask. If you have not done this already, go to iTunes and give us a rating and a review, okay? Last time I checked, I think we were at maybe 175, 180, somewhere in there. I'd love to get to 200 ratings and reviews just so we can continue to grow the show and get it in front of more trainers, coaches, and rehab professionals such as yourself. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.